Production funding for this program is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, welcome to a conversation with Peter Goralnik. I'm Tom Prestigiacomo. Yes, that's my real name. It's my pleasure to introduce you to a book that is absolutely wonderful. Sam Phillips, The Man Who Invented Rock and Roll. Peter, this is your 10th book, is that correct? I don't know, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go by your account. <laughs> okay, okay that, I, I read that in another <laughs> review. But, it, it could be. But I, I'm, I'm looking at your, your top, your, uh, your subjects. There's Sam Cooke, mm -hmm. there's two great volumes that, that if you love Elvis Presley, you can't live without that oh, you did. And, and, and then this one comes into mind. So did you find rock and roll or did rock and roll find you? Uh, the blues found me. I mean, when I was 15 or 16, uh, and I can't tell you why this happened, but I just fell into the blues. A friend of mine and I uh, started listening to records. Uh, his, his older brother had gone to the Newport Folk Festival, came back with an undifferentiated you know, group of records. It could right. have been Joan Baez or, well, not, she had made records at that point. Right. But, but, you know, it, all kinds of folk, and among them were blues. And, and this friend of mine and I, we just started, we, and, and it just, it grabbed me in a way that just turned me completely around. And that was what led me to every other kind of music. I mean, it wasn't that I hadn't heard Elvis Presley say, but I wasn't that interested in, in him as a pop phenomenon. But then, subsequent to the, my discovery of blues, I heard the sun size. I said, oh my God, he's a blues singer. Right. And then I was open to much broader form. And, and the same way, it, it, I'd say in general, uh, you know, what opened me up to country most of all. I mean, I heard Hank Williams when I was a kid, and I heard Jimmy Rogers a little bit. Right. But Waylon Jennings, uh, you know, stuff like Honky Tonk Heroes, and a couple of albums before that this time. It was when I heard Waylon Jennings, it was just, I thought, well, you know, it, I don't want to call everything blues, but the point is he's singing stuff that's as close to him, that's as much from the heart, as much from the soul as anything else. And in the in between, I, I ran into Solomon Burke and Joe Tex and Otis Redding. I saw all of them not long after, and, and I thought, well, this is a continuation. So I don't want to be monomaniacal about it, but it was the blues right. that turned me on to Elvis. Oh, so you're a vinyl geek. Basically, the music that you listened to came from, did you find it on the radio anywhere? Yeah, there was a, there was a station in Boston, WILD, which was the first black station in the Boston area. They started playing uh, African-American music around the time that soul music really burst forth, and I went to the first summer soul shower of stars uh, with Solomon Burke, Joe Tex, Otis Redding. And so I, what years are those? Th that was 64. And, okay. and, uh, I mean, but when I, f you know, for me the blues was happened 59 or 60, so it was a little ways in. But I would listen on the radio. But no, I wouldn't say I was a vinyl geek. I was never into, I, I bought albums. I bought a lot of Lightning Hopkins albums. But I wasn't interested in collecting. I, I felt the live experience. I still feel I trade all of my I, I all of my recorded music for just one time of seeing Howlin' Wolf again. I mean it's just, you know, that it's the spirit of the music, it's the feeling of the music, it's the soul of the music. It doesn't matter whether it's gospel, whether it's blues, whether it's uh, So the foundation is built. When did you decide to start writing about these guys? Well, I started uh, well, I wanted to be a writer and I I had written my first novel by the time I was 19. I've written ten novels now. I've had I've had one novel published, part of another published. I had another one accepted, and first uh, the publishing company went out of business. Then the editor who bought it at the next publishing company got fired, and I thought that's enough. <laughs> this is a sign. Uh, but but I started writing about the music. Uh, I guess really when I was around twenty two, twenty three, but it was solely with the intent of telling people about this music. I thought it was so great. When the underground uh, newspaper started up in, in Boston, there was Boston After Dark. The Voice, the Village Voice, preceded it. A kid I knew uh, started a, a magazine called Crawdaddy, which was mimeographed at first, which was probably the first rock and roll magazine. And these people, in one way, for different reasons, came to me and asked me if I. I mean, they knew I wrote. They knew I was crazy about the music, and they said, "Would you like to write?" So I said, "Yeah," but only about the blues or soul or whatever, right. you know. I just felt like I had to tell the world about Howlin' Wolf, about Muddy Waters, about Bo Diddley, about Big Joe Turner, about and James in Brown. empathetic terms, not not just oh, objective I was, yeah, reporting. No, no, I had no interest in objective reporting, and probably still don't. I wanted to. I was an advocate for the music, and when I wrote about James Brown, for example, I was writing about the greatest theatrical event I had ever witnessed, and I would still say that. And I went to a lot of 
theater then and happenings were in great vogue, right. which was spontaneous theater, which involved the audience. Okay. And I said, man, the greatest, you know, forget happenings, the greatest happening you're ever going to see. To an audience that had never seen James Brown, this is 67, and he had, at that point, ha had, if he had come to Boston, it was, he had barely, and he was coming back to the Boston Garden. I had seen him down in Providence a couple of years earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I said, you know, if you're talking about happenings, if you're talking about spontaneous eruptions, this is the greatest, uh, you know, uh, greatest uh, demonstration of spontaneity you'll ever see. And, you know, I had maybe 150, 250 words, but that was, it was designed, and it was to describe the James Brown show when Howlin' Wolf came to town, same thing. Well, here's my question next. Uh, tell me about the makeup of the crowd that was at the James Brown show. Boston's was, a liberal enough all, town. No, it was all black. You, were you the only white person there? I mean, or? One, one of a handful, but, you know, I, I uh, and when I started ushering the soul shows, this was in 64, uh, a girl I knew had, um, was going out with really a low-level, mafia uh, person and who was connected in some obscure way with the promotion and she said to me, I always liked this, this girl, uh, this young woman, and she, uh, but I, she said, well, how would you like to usher the shows? And I was terrified. I mean, usher the shows, not because of the complexion of the thing, but just because I, I however, uh, however much at ease I may seem now, and I may right. not seem it at all, I was not at ease about anything then. But I, I couldn't turn down the opportunity, so I did, and I was the worst usher there's ever been. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the, uh, you'd go to the, you'd show these people to this nice young couple to their seats, and there'd be these two hired guys sitting there with the, their arms crossed and, you know, saying, what, what do you want to do about it? And I'd right. say, I want to go get the head usher, you know. <laughs> 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 well, kids would break in from the balcony door, you know, up off the fire escape. Right. And the head usher would say, ushers, ushers, to the, you know, and I just would head in the opposite direction. <laughs> but I got to see all these great, and I'd be backstage. I'd see Jackie Wilson backstage, or Little Richard when he came back from uh, gospel music. I saw him uh, co-headlining or sub-headlining a, a show that Moms Mabley headlined. And it was the most thrilling thing in the world, so it, it, was, it was sensational. So what drew you to, let's, let's, let's talk about your Elvis books first. What, what drew you to start there? Blues. Okay. And, and wow. what, no, I mean, it was just, it was seeing Elvis, I mean, for years, I was disappointed every time Elvis didn't record a blues because I thought I had stamped him in my mind <laughs> right. as a blues singer, and I thought, why is he letting down all his fans? But of course, I was the only one who thought of it like that. Right. But but you know, my tastes uh, broadened. I mean, I, I I thought he was an extraordinary talent, just as Jerry Lee Lewis is, just as Bo Diddley, just as James Brown. I mean, I see Elvis, and I think he would see himself as part of a continuum of great music, and his, his entire aspiration was to take his place among, uh, amidst all this music that he loved, the mm -hmm. Soul Stirrers, the Blackwood Brothers, right. Hank Williams, uh, Little Junior Parker, Howlin' Wolf. I mean, he, and uh, so, you know, I'd say Elvis, Jerry Lee, they, they educated me, and that's what, it, that's what took me to, but I just, you know, I wasn't somebody, I didn't want to sign on just for whatever I knew. Right. I wanted to voyage out into unknown territory. In your in your Sam Phillips book, the the way that you project Elvis was just a scared kid. Oh it, well, yeah, I think that you know uh, Sam described him both in the you know in, in the Elvis biography I wrote right. in Last Train to Memphis and in this Sam Phillips biography, he described him as the most insecure person he'd ever seen in the studio, and he he said he appeared markedly like a black person in that respect. Like, I mean, not that everybody, but you know, Sam's entire commitment, the reason he opened the studio on January 2nd, 1950, was he, he said it was to give an opportunity to uh, black artists in the South who didn't have the opportunity to go anywhere else. It was not designed as a custom service. It was not designed, I mean, he had to do that to stay in business. He mm -hmm. recorded weddings, he recorded bar mitzvahs, he recorded funerals. Everything, yeah. You know, yes, and, and he recorded the, the automobile exhausts for, for, for a case in uh, court, where, you know, because Memphis has always had that anti-noise ordinance. Right. But uh, everything was really intended to dedicate, uh, to uh, record the great African-American music that he had been focused on since he was a kid. I was surprised that, that he called it race music. I, I'd never well, I, no, seen that. No, that was what it was called. There, right. there was pre, pre, and that was the official designation in the, trade, uh, in the trades. It was race music until 1948 when Jerry Wexler, uh, who later became vice president of uh, Atlantic so. Records, but Jerry Wexler suggested to Paul Ackerman, the editor, that they should change the 
uh, you know, the title from race music to rhythm and blues, rhythm and blues. It, that it was more accurate and it was more respectful. And so when Sam became available, he did gospel music. It, uh, I'm thinking more of the, the music that he recorded as opposed to just the other sounds and everything else. But, but he found artists that are legends, black artists. Well, he was op like Elvis. He was open to hearing. He didn't hear through prejudiced ears. He didn't shut his ears. I mean, anybody growing up in Memphis at the time that Elvis was growing up couldn't have missed the sounds that were coming from every direction unless their ears were blocked. But most people's ears are blocked, they're blocked to this day, by whatever preconceptions. We, you, you can call it prejudice, you, can, you know, I'm blocked by all kinds of things that, right. you know, one has preconceptions. But Elvis was wide open to anything, and Sam was wide open to anything. But through that he found R Riley King, Mm -hmm. um, he, he found Riley, Helen, Riley B. King. Riley B. King. Well, we <laughs> could call him B.B. King. Um, uh, and, and Helen Wolf. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I love the fact in this book how Becky, Sam's wife, got along with Helen Wolf. They were. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it was actually, it was, it was um, Marion Keisker who worked for Sam was his, uh, you know, just did everything. I mean, Girl she, Friday. And yeah, Saturday and Sunday, Monday right, and Tuesday. Right, right. I mean, she was a wonderful person, as was his wife Becky. Becky was a sensational radio person and the nicest person you could ever meet. Uh, but Marion was uh, Marion, who really cared nothing about the music, right. who said everything she did was just out of pure, unadulterated love for, for Sam. Sam. Yeah, right. And she said that the first time I met her, and I was just shocked because I had read about her and and I had never imagined that that was her role. Uh, but it, but but Wolf was somebody she was totally taken by. I knew her for quite a number of years. She had these acetates with various alternate takes of songs that are familiar, you know, through right. the issued versions. And she just uh, and Wolf, uh, she found Wolf, who was an enormous guy. I mean, he was maybe six three, six four. Uh, I think he wore size thirteen or thirteen and a half shoes. Wow. And, you know, he was w well over. He was probably about 225, 235 pounds then, or, but he was a big guy. But there was something also about him, and he, was, and he had this gruff voice, this growl. I mean, he wasn't called Howlin' Wolf for nothing. But, but he was in many, he was an extremely, extremely sensitive person. And he was uh, somebody who, with a keen intelligence, who was often under, underestimated. And, and talk about Rufus Thomas and his involvement. And, uh, all of these artists that, and I want to draw attention to the fact that that eventually, when we get to Jerry Lee Lewis and, and Elvis, he never looked back into the into the black music scene. And I always wondered if Sam could have changed his world by using BB King and and by using Rufus Thomas and 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 creating them as opposed to letting them go to other places. Well, the point was he they were going, they did go to other places. Right. In respect. I mean, before he ever stopped recording them. Wolf went to Chicago. Uh, Rufus Thomas, although this wasn't a story he told, and Rufus was one of my, I, I loved Rufus, and he was a very good friend for a long time. Mm -hmm. But he never would, did say that he had signed with Star Talent, uh, which was a DIA offshoot, a DIA label that mm -hmm. uh, never really came to anything, but that he had signed with them long before, uh, you know, it wasn't Sam cutting him loose, he cut Sam loose. Right. And it was long before Elvis came into the his studio. But no, Sam didn't. Sam was a uh, a one man operation essentially, and uh, he always considered that uh, a, a one of his greatest faults was an inability to delegate, and he couldn't. But he, he didn't have anyone to delegate it to. I mean, right. Marion took care of a lot of the bookkeeping. But I should say that that one of the things he believed so firmly in the idea that this was music, the music that he was recording: Ike Turner, Howlin' Wolf, B.B. King, Little Junior Parker. Um, Rufus Thomas, that this was music that was going to cross over. It was going to obliterate the class and race distinctions that dominated, the segregation right. that dominated the music industry as it, did not, as it did everything else. When the first hit that he recorded, and he, uh, he, was not, he didn't have a label, he didn't want to have a label. He, wanted to, right. he, was, he considered this a pure jo task. And I think he thought somehow or other having your own label and having the headaches that went with it would sully the purity of what he was doing. So he sold it to Leonard Chess, and essentially he was partners with Leonard Chess of Chess Records right. on the records he sold. And I, I, it was only recently that I came across the uh, paperwork that showed this, and he actually made a fair amount of money. Sam on did. It. Sam did. Good. But on the other hand, 
he was not, as, Mar as Marion said, he was not a partner type person. He was not a, and as a junior partner, he was even worse because he wasn't going to keep his own views down. But what I was going to say was he had the hit with Rocket 88. It was a huge hit. It went to number one on the R&B charts. Mm -hmm. It sold over 100,000 copies, which I wouldn't have believed, but I found the paperwork for it recently. That's a huge, huge hit. I mean, Muddy Waters at that time might have a number three Billboard hit with a record that sold 25 or 30,000 right. copies. But it, and, he's, and he brought a reporter from the Commercial Appeal out to uh, the W.C. Handy Theater in Orange Mound to see uh, Ike Turner and Jackie Branston. And right. I, I can't remember whether they were the Kings of Rhythm then. or. Uh, but, uh, and the reporter, who was a business reporter, the music reporter was on leave, but the, the reporter wrote a brave re review comparing Ike Turner to Fats Waller, and you know it was a very positive review. But he also uh, he also interviewed Sam, which m might amount to Sam's first public utterance. I mean, he said lots of things which people that I spoke to heard. But and in the course of that, he suggested that Rocket e eighty eight was was the kind of r music that could appeal to all people. It could reach a mainstream audience. That was his goal from the very beginning. After he formed the, started the Sun Record Company a couple of years later, he had one hit after another, including uh, hits by Rufus Thomas, right. Little Junior's Blue Flames, The Prisoners, Just Walking in the Rain. None of them sold more than 50,000 copies. They were hits, but they were, they were. Not big sellers. No, and they, and they were, they, they were essentially limited to the race label. I mean, by, I mean they were. They, were, they had that label put on them, and they were not going to sell to a mainstream audience. And that was when he thought, well, you know, the only way I'm ever going to get across, the only way I'm ever going to reach that mainstream audience, and by that, you know, you're, you're without, you have to be thinking white, right. but the only way I'm going to reach that mainstream audience, black and white together, cut across the category lines, is to find, you know, it's that famous quote which Marion Keisker gave, to find a white man who, could, who you know, who, who could write, who who could uh, yeah, sing like a Negro, who could sound like a Negro, but more important, uh, who has a Negro sound, but much more important, has the Negro feel. I mean, Negro being the term of respect at that time. I understand. And uh, he said, I could make a billion dollars, and he would laugh, you know, the billion, because, and Marion said it just, it wasn't the money he was concerned about. But what he firmly believed was that once that f first, once the sound made it across, you know, without the, uh, uh, you know, without the audience being put off by the prejudice, the ingrained prejudice which they felt, he was convinced the doors would open wide, and that right behind, you know, right behind the success of the of this music, would come all the great African American artists, artists, people like Ray Charles, people like Bo Diddley, people like mm -hmm. Chuck Berry, uh, you know, people like Little Richard. The Platters. The well, spots. the Platters actually, they were crossover artists because they right. were singing music which was actually more. It was almost pop, you know. Uh, it was like brill building. It's great music, but uh, but he took the music out of the parlor. It wasn't. He took, he took it wasn't polite anymore. And let me do this real quick. Yes. If if you're just joining us, Peter Goralnik is my guest. Uh, we're having a conversation with him regarding his new book, Sam Phillips, the man who invented uh, rock and roll. Thank you. Now, so do you think that that Sam further integrated it? Oh. Further integrated the radio dial. Totally. Yeah. No. No. I mean, but I think. He would be the first to say it wasn't. It wasn't that he himself did. His belief was that this was going to happen. Other people, like Paul Ackerman, very few had that kind of. First, Paul Ackerman was the editor of Billboard, and one of Sam's, uh, one of the people Sam most admired. Uh, but he didn't know him at this time. But he admired him from afar. Right. And uh, but the, most people were lo who. I mean, the the trades at that point were seeing a commercial trend. They were seeing that the categories were breaking down to a degree that. Whites were buying under the counter. They were buying African American music, right? Uh, but nobody knew where this was going to go. Sam believed that the music was just going to—it was just going to crack the walls. And I think, in essence, that that is exactly what happened. But it it would be wrong to give Sam Phillips alone the credit. I mean, it was happening as a phenomenon, but it was his firm belief and his determination to record music not just to fill up a catalog, not just to you know, have something right. to take around to the distributor, something music to in sell. which he, something to say, something to, yeah. That's right, not just something to sell, something but that had say. something to say. And he put that, and, and with, you know, in the wake of Elvis, out of this tiny storefront studio, just something that when Ike Turner first 
drove up with his band. He drove by it three times because he, thought, he said it looked like a barbershop. He thought a recording studio would be palatial. And that's, that surprised me most that Ike Turner was a talent scout for Sun Studio for the longest time, looking for music in Mississippi. Well, he, Ike Turner was a very enterprising young man. He was 19 when he came to Sam, and he was, he was a very interesting guy. Accomplished pianist, right? Uh, well, yeah, although he, he, he was more an energetic pian pianist. Okay. And, uh, I wouldn't compare him to Fats Waller. He became a better guitarist. That, that was very delicately done. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he uh, no, he, he was a person, of, he was a very, you know, a person of both voracious intelligence and also, and great determination. And he didn't suffer fools gladly. And some people who weren't fools, he didn't suffer gladly. Right. Uh, but he was looking for uh, the chance for himself, as we all are. and. Uh, after the hit, after Rocket 88, the band broke up as, as everybody connected with the band said, Jackie Brenston got the big head. He was right. a singer on it. And it was listed as Jackie Brenston and his Delta Cats, even right. though it was really Ike, uh, Turner. Ike Turner and his Kings of Rhythm. And the band broke up within a month or two when Jack, Jackie Brenston went off and it, uh, on his own. I mean, maybe keeping the band name, but it didn't exist. And Ike drifted around for a few months and played with Howlin' Wolf. But essentially what happened was, uh, the uh, Bahari brothers, who owned Modern Records, and who thought they had, well, they didn't really think they had an agreement with Sam, but they were stung. He had, his, he had, Sam had placed his first records with the Bahari brothers. Right. He never felt that he was dealt right by, most of all, by uh, Jules Bahari, who was the oldest. He, he always liked Joe Bahari and Saul was somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. But when Leonard Chess came in and offered him what amounted to a business partnership, he jumped on it. Right. This didn't bother. Uh, Jules Bahari at all until Rocket 88 went to number one and all of a sudden he thought I should have had that record. Gotcha. So he, the Baharis came in and signed up every one of Sam's acts claiming that they weren't registered with the union, which they couldn't be registered with the union because the union was segregated, although they were registered. Anyway, it's, it's too uh, reckoned. But, but the point is that was when Ike Turner then signed up with, with the Bahari brothers, became their talent scout, traveled all through Arkansas, through the Mississippi Delta, and found all these great uh, artists and was given a card, you know, by uh, Joe Bahari and was very close to them. All right, I'm, I've got about four minutes left before we wrap this up and, and, and I wanted to, I, I could do a week's worth of interviews with you. This is an incredible well, book that you've it. written. I wish. <laughs> but, but here's the question I want to ask. Um, in, in the other books that you wrote, you, you did research and, and you wrote down the facts, but in, in the Sam Phillips book, you knew him for 25 years. Did, did that affect your objectivity in, in your ability to write? Or no. did it? No, I mean, Sam, he told this to his family. I mean, in, in, talking to Knox, his sons Knox right. and Jerry, talking to his wife Becky, who was the sweetest person in the world, uh, uh, talking to Sally Wilburn, who lived with Sam for, for the last 50 and years. Still of his lives. lives in that house on. Still lives in the house, yeah. And, uh, he, you know, Every one of them, they every, at times they may have had some hesitation, and then they would say, "It's like Jerry said. I know what Sam would do. He would say, tell the damn truth.' And that, right. so, but but I wasn't looking to expose anything. It wasn't a question of that. Mm -hmm. It was it was just telling a true story. And and you said objectivity. I I don't believe in objectivity any more than Sam believed in perfection. But I, it's it's true. You loved Sam Phillips. I mean, he, I loved Howlin' Wolf. It, and I wrote about. It. I loved Charlie Rich. But he gave you a great story to tell, and I mean, it it's a movie waiting to happen. But you know, in the two minutes we have left, how much can we talk about Kemmons Wilson together with? I mean, who was a giant who invented luxury mo or family motels and right, right. and his because involvement he, because he drove to D.C. and they, they charged extra for his kids. Right, and he had a lot of kids. And he, he had five, as a matter of yeah, fact. Yeah. So, so the, the point is, is that somehow Sam Phillips and, and he got together. Well, they were two great, they were two great examples of the Memphis exactly. maverick spirit, of the independent spirit of Memphis. He shared the same birthday with Sam. They were 10 years apart. Mm -hmm. But Sam, he was one of the, I would say, four or five people. Sam's brother-in-law, Jimmy Connolly, Dewey Phillips. Um, we just spoke of somebody else that, uh, oh, oh, uh, uh, at, at Billboard, uh, the, uh, Paul Ackerman, right. and Kemmons. And you couldn't find two more unlike people. Uh, Agreed. They're, they're, uh, I mean, Kemmons was, I, I, you know, I only met Kemmons a few times, and I loved Kemmons, but he was, he was nothing like Sam Phillips. And he right. was just, he, I would say he was the kind of person who might be put off by some of Sam's more 
uh, extemporaneous behavior. Right. Uh, but they were the, they were great friends, and Sam thought the world of him because he was and good he, business partners too. They they were, and but you know, but Kemmons was willing to do something different as he, he was an example of what Sam prized, individualism in the extreme, exactly. as Sam would say. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the name of the book I'd, is Sam Phillips, The Man Who Invented Rock and Roll. The author is Peter Goralnik, who took some time to be with us today. Thank you so very much for coming through Memphis, and, and I'm glad you're back. What will you do while you're here? Oh, Besides interviews. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm off tomorrow, and you know, I'm, just, I, I'm doing a thing at Brooks tonight. And, uh, so I, 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 I always have a great time in Memphis, though. I, I have spent uh, probably more time in Memphis than I have in my own hometown, and, and I certainly know more people in Memphis and have more friends. So that may speak badly of me as, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as far as my neglect of my, of my hometown goes. But that's, that's the way I've always felt since I first came here in 1969. Thanks, Peter, for being here. Well, thank you. This has been a conversation with Peter Goralnik. Thank you for watching.